Joining us in the studio this morning is our county prosecutor from Twin Falls County, Grant Lobes. Uh, he does this, of course, on a monthly basis on a Tuesday morning with us. And you're listening to News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. And uh, Bill Colley with you, too, as well on Top Story. And at seven minutes after nine o'clock, we have uh, 58. Uh, right off the top, I guess the, uh, the, the, the smart aleck in me realizes that, uh, uh, that. The, probably the question is, so anything exciting happened in your life over the last 72 hours? Yeah, it's been a busy week. <laughs> it's been, really been a busy couple weeks because, uh, um, you know, we've had one major thing follow close on the heels of another. Um, but it uh, it keeps everything busy. We, we're uh, running around uh, trying to keep up with everything and trying to do our job and trying to respond to questions from the public and from the press and um, you know uh, I went to the city council meeting last night and observed that and um, there's a lot of anger frustration um, misinformation and both the police and my office have been trying to uh, keep up with that well you know I, I was listening at home uh, last night to the uh, to the web stream from the meeting and I heard people get up, and, and obviously they were angry, as you point out, and, and some of them were denouncing you. But it, it struck mm. me that a lot of them are doing that because they don't really know what your job is all about. I mean, you know, they, they know that you put people away, uh, that that's primarily what the job is about, or at least that you, you, know, you, you try to convince people not to do it again. Right. But I think that, unfortunately, the public just doesn't understand that there are certain limits sometimes to what you do. Right, and... Um... You know, you, you mentioned that uh, at the meeting there were some people, um, excuse me, <clears throat> there were, I mean, a lot of people were being denounced. Uh, and again, uh, you know, people are frustrated, people are afraid, people are angry about what has happened, uh, and and that's understandable. Um, and they, they were blaming the city council for it. They were blaming certain city councilmen for it. Um, they were blaming the police for it. They were blaming my office and me personally for it and I, I couldn't I couldn't quite understand all of what that was about other than it was just anger uh, in part I think there was um, some anger that the police hadn't called a press conference about this or we hadn't released a lot of information about it and and that is I think goes back to your question about the, the fundamental misunderstanding as to what we're supposed to be mm -hmm. doing um, and you know there there are times when we have to make comments to the public, uh, and that's fine. There there I actually would rather explain something to the public than have to tell them all the time that I can't talk about it because it'll jeopardize the case, or because there's a protective order on the case, or the case is sealed, or something like that. Because that always sounds to people like, well, you're hiding stuff. Well, um, the system can't function if everything the police know when they know it is public. They can't do an investigation. If if they hold a press conference and explain everything that they're doing and all that they're gathering, what they're considering in trying to decide uh, to charge somebody or how the case is going and you know what the newest information is, that jeopardizes the ability to do the case. And the second part of that is uh, if you engage in that, it jeopardizes the ability to have a fair trial uh, and of course, it shines um, often unwanted light on victims, victims' families, especially in a case where they're children, uh, as in this case in Fonbrook. And uh, and then thirdly, um, you know, in this case, because it deals with juveniles, the the court has sealed the court filings. Now that doesn't mean they have sealed everything, because uh, the court order to seal the court filings doesn't seal you know, the ability of the police to talk about some aspects of it. But um, it seals my ability to talk about specifically what charges were filed, what evidence we have, what um, what documents we filed, what hearings are happening and how they're happening, the ages, names, um, other information about the defendants and also the victims. Uh, and so when the court does that, we have to be very careful about what we say and uh, some of what even that I said yesterday probably gets close to the line on that but when there's so much misinformation about something I think it's important to at least say this is not what happened that is not what we're dealing with and that information is not correct 
Um, but at the same time, I, I really can't because of the court order and because of the other matters that I, the other concerns that I mentioned, go into a lot of detail about it. I think too, sometimes there's a confusion among the public. Uh, the, the bloggers were using the word rape, uh, but it's, it's, it's a little bit like homicide. I tried to explain this in a post I did last night at our website. If somebody knows that someone was killed on the street, the, the, the vernacular says my neighbor was murdered. Mm -hmm. But murdered is just a degree of homicide. There are several different homicides, and, and, and so it could well, be murder. Well, murder is a crime. Right. Homicide just means a person was killed by another person. Right. I mean, if I'm walking along the street and you come at me with a shotgun and I draw my gun and shoot you and kill you, that's a homicide. But it's not a murder. It's not a crime uh, because I would be within my rights to have used self-defense if you tried to kill me with a shotgun. So homicide's the general, the generic term used to mean a person killed another person. Right. But it doesn't say that it's a crime. Now, murder is always a crime. But but just in, in attacks, um, rape is a degree of an attack, but it's not necessarily all attacks. Right. And, and there are a lot of things like kidnapping, for instance. Uh, there are kidnappings that we have charged uh, which do not meet the generally accepted public idea of what a kidnapping is. You know, kidnapping is, you know, you sneak into the house, you steal the Lindbergh baby, you send a, a ransom note with you know, letters cut out from various magazines. That's what people think a kidnapping is. Uh, that isn't necessarily what the law is about kidnapping. And the same is true with rape. People have an idea in their heads about what rape is, but the technical legal definition of rape might not conform to what the the lay person thinks it is um, but in in any case you know the a lot of the um, national kind of um, bloggers I guess they are um, had this case in Twin Falls so wrong and it made Twin Falls look very bad I think it made the case look um, really unrecognizable for from what the people who were working on it know it to be and at some point it just became necessary for both me and and then later in the in the evening the police chief to talk about it and correct it well and i was over the weekend i was looking i just had seen a blog so i started typing in certain search keywords into google and uh, during the course of about uh, this started saturday and by sunday i was watching this snowball and then drudge report yesterday morning it's a bit like watching a pandemic spread uh where the virus just suddenly goes from you know uh, or, or zero to sixty in a in you right. know in somebody's car. It just was amazing how this thing, just just to use another analogy, snowballed over the weekend, and then by Monday morning it was like holy mackerel. Yeah, and and part of that, and I think part of the frustration among some of the public that are they're just sincerely concerned here, um, not not the people that are you know might be using it for for some kind of political statement, but the people that are really concerned, and and I don't discount that there are a lot of those people. Uh, but part of the problem is that they hear a thing happen, they ask questions, answers aren't given because of the concerns I mentioned to you before. I mean, the police aren't going to tell you exactly what's happening because they're in the middle of an investigation. Um, I can't tell you what's happening because I'm in the middle of analyzing what they've investigated and you know have all kinds of rules on me to not say things about it. And so there's a rumor that something happened. Uh, the rumor gets bigger and bigger. It has elements of truth in it for sure, uh, but also elements that are either conjecture or, in this case, kind of flat made up. Um, and so people get worried and they start repeating what they've heard. And so it spreads naturally like that. Um, and really most of the major cases we have um, over the years have an element of that. Um, but this one really took off in a different direction. And and the sad thing, in part, is that it detracts from the fact that this is a really serious incident. This is a uh, an actual victim who was actually victimized in a very terrible way, uh, and the police are actually doing a good job finding out exactly what happened. And we're in the midst of you know working a criminal case um, about what actually happened, and all this misinformation kind of detracts from the reality of it. Um, and, you know, the, the victim's family then has to read things that didn't happen. Then they have to read statements by me and by the police that say, well, that's not re what really happened. And it sounds like it's being minimized when, in fact, um, we are treating this as a very serious case. Social media, uh, the, what, what it has brought, though, uh, 
our, our mutual acquaintance, uh, Bill Fitzpatrick, once told me, he said that with the rise of social media, he has never had to prosecute more uh, harassment cases. He just said they, they, because people get angry and they send an email and uh, there's an arrest then because of harassment or uh, threats made, uh, which didn't exist before social media. But social media also has generated this echo chamber mm. where we ended up yesterday, as you say, being on the Drudge Report. You made a comment to one of the newspapers. They called you, and you were reading it, literally, yeah. Yeah. on Drudge at the same time. Yeah. Uh, Syrian refugees rape five-year-old at gun at knife point is what the Drudge Report headline was, and mm -hmm. uh, none of that was true. And by saying, well, there weren't Syrian refugees involved, that doesn't mean that there weren't there wasn't something bad, and some people didn't do a bad thing, but they weren't Syrians. And uh, one of the one of the people last night at the uh, at the city council meeting said, "Who cares if they weren't Syrians? They were somebody, and they did a horrible thing." That's exactly my point. I don't care if they're Syrians or not, but the fact that it spread out there mm -hmm. among the public that they are Syrians adds fuel to the fire because it links this incident with another issue, which is obviously uh, a very um, touchy, sensitive, controversial issue, that being whether Syrians should be admitted to this country as refugees. And this this case has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with whether Syrians should be here as refugees. Uh, and well, what, what if they're Muslims? I don't care if they're Muslims. I mean, I understand that's a public issue that uh, is being debated, and that's fine. I, you know, I've, I have opinions about that like other people do. But in terms of prosecuting this case, I don't care if they're Muslims or Christians or Jews or, you know, I don't care what they are. Uh, if they've done a bad thing to an innocent victim, they need to be held accountable for that. Uh, and it, you know, it won't add one bit to the way I present this case to know what religion they are. And again, I would assume that because of the preponderance, this is still an overwhelmingly white country and most people profess to be Christians, that in most assault cases you have, most of those involve Caucasians who are likely Christians just because of the overwhelming numbers. So someone's background doesn't necessarily mean well, sure. yeah, that they I, have a certain pattern of behavior. And that, and that of course, is true. Um, you know, uh, we, unfortunately, uh, the fact that a juvenile or juveniles have attacked another juvenile in a sexual way, uh, whether you call that rape or lewd and lascivious conduct or, or whatever, that is not a rare thing. I mean, we prosecute a number of those every year. And over the past 20 years, I've prosecuted, you know, dozens and dozens of those. Um, and it's a sad thing when it happens, whoever the person is who does it, but almost all of those are Caucasians on Caucasians over the years. We have more coming up with Grant Loeb's Twin Falls County Prosecutor. It's 20 minutes after 9 o'clock. 58, Bill Colley with you as well on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Joining us in studio is uh, Twin Falls County Prosecutor Grant Loeb's. Right now, of course, coming up on uh, 925, Bill Colley with you as well on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Quick reminder, we'll have either Dr. Jonathan Tripp or one of his associates in studio with us tomorrow between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. And the doctor is on his way in a few weeks to Nicaragua as part of a mission trip. He's taking along his sons, too, as well. And uh, they are looking to pay their own way, and uh, that means they have to mow a lot of grass this summer. So if you need someone to actually take care of that for you, uh, they would be willing to do that. You can uh, drop by the doctor's office and set that up. And they're also looking for toiletries to take along on the trip. His office is located on Fillmore Street, directly across from the main post office in Twin Falls. And I uh, hope you can uh, you can uh, do them a favor and help them out in this uh, this particular, what well, you call it a mission of mercy, if you will. Right now it's uh, 59. Bill Colley with you with Grant Loeb's this morning. And, you know, we had actually planned to talk about some other things today. Uh, there was a rumor, if I can throw this at you, over the weekend that Clarence, Th Clarence Thomas was going to retire from the Supreme Court. And then his wife yesterday said, no, he's got no intention of going anytime soon. Uh, but this week is uh, is big week at the Supreme Court. Right. They're, they're finishing up all of the cases that they've been holding um, all this time. And it usually means they're going to release the most controversial cases at the end. That's Thursday. That's a typical way of doing it, yeah. Thursday this week. Yeah. And there'll be a couple today. I think there's 11 total, but a couple today, a couple tomorrow, and then yeah, the big three maybe on Thursday that, that are expected to come down. Two cases out of Texas, 
uh, and one case dealing with the president's efforts to, uh, the, I guess, wave a fig leaf and get people right. uh, the immigration uh, right uh, executive orders, and then the two abortion cases. I think are out of Texas, aren't they? Or right. One of the, and then there's a well, they they declared they weren't going to hear some, uh, and therefore waiting essentially until the new justice is appointed before they do that. And then they declared flat out they're not going to take up some, just let the lower court's ruling stand. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, the later this week you're going to hear some of the controversial ones. And it'll be interesting to, to see what they do with their, you know, eight-person court. Um, but the thing is, it didn't come to an end. The world didn't come to an end as many people predicted without Scalia there hearing these cases. No, and of course it didn't. I mean, there, as we all know, there isn't anything in the Constitution that mandates the number of justices. That's just the way it's been for so long that we assume that the court has to have nine justices. And we generally think that it should have nine or seven or something odd so that there's not a bunch of tie votes. But tie votes actually do have effect. I mean, if there's a tie vote in the Supreme Court, then the lower court, court ruling is sustained. So... A tie isn't irrelevant. It's a decision. Uh, so, yeah, the, obviously the world didn't come to an end. But uh, uh, you know, for conservatives, the world will come to an end if just if Justice Thomas retires and uh, Hillary Clinton wins and appoints somebody for that spot as well as for Scalia's spot. So, uh, it is good news for conservatives that he says he's not retiring. Glenn Urquhart, who uh, worked for Ronald Reagan and built all of the uh, underground structures in Washington for security, White House, executive office building, and I think even around the Capitol, uh, once told me, he said, you can have just one Supreme Court justice, uh, and, and, and that justice, that one justice could decide every case uh, that, that would come before the court. Now, obviously, that hasn't happened, but uh, I think that that backs up what you say. There's no real number, and right. Franklin Roosevelt actually tried to raise it to 15. Right. Which, you know, would have been legal. Uh, it's just that people saw it for what it was, an attempt to um, pack the court with people who had his position and therefore overwhelm the people that were there. Um, but there isn't any preclusion against having 15, or, or frankly, there's no requirement that there be an odd number. There could be 10. You could have, you could stay with eight if you wanted to. Um, but uh, I think that that's unlikely. I think that uh, the the number nine has been ingrained in society for so long, and that will be the number we have in our in our lifetime. And I did read where Justice Kagan, at least on one of these cases this week, recuses herself because of her pri previous experience. Right. So there will be a seven court, uh, seven court a member court deciding that case. So then you could actually get a majority versus a tie. Right. And of course, you know, in all Supreme Courts, whether it's a Idaho court or, you know, the, the U.S. Supreme Court, there are times when judges recuse themselves from a thing and then they, cases are decided with fewer votes. Um, so it is not the end of the world. I think the, the end of the world um, rhetoric is twofold. One, conservative who thinks it's the end of the world because Scalia is gone and now we might lose a lot of things. And two, liberals who think it's the end of the world because they want to say it's the end of the world so that the Supreme Court vacancy is filled by Obama before the election. So uh, it, they're both saying that because of their political views. And it doesn't look like it's having much of an impact on the public either way at the moment. No, not so far. And, you know, because they're not going to see any damage as a result of it, at least right now. Um, We'll see what's once the election is held in November and the new president takes over in January. Um, that will be a big, big change depending upon who the president is. Got more with Grant Loeb's on the way. You're listening to Top Story with Bill Colley on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. It's 9 30 and it's 59. Our guest uh, during this half hour of the program, Grant Loeb's, he is the Twin Falls County prosecutor. You're listening to News Radio 1310, KLIX, and NewsRadio1310.com. And it's, well, hey, we've had a huge spike in the temperature. According to what I'm looking at, we've jumped to 70. So if there had been any cloud cover apparently holding us back, that's moved out of the way. And our telephone number is 736 736 While you're in studio with us, obviously, because of your job, you have a concentration in constitutional law. After Orlando, uh, it failed yesterday. There were four, obviously, provisions, gun provisions in the Senate that didn't make it. Uh, but one of these things that's been bandied about, it's proposed by Susan Collins, who's a rather, 
she's described as a moderate Republican from Maine. Right. Uh, she proposed uh, tying, uh, uh, you know, denying gun sales to people on the no-fly list. Today, the Heritage Foundation says you simply can't do it because of the uh, U.S. Constitution. Well, because a couple of things. One, the constitutional argument that being there's no due process, you can't fight that because you're on the no-fly list, and there's really no due process for that. Uh, and so if you deny a constitutional right to somebody without giving them any way to argue the matter or to fight it or to have a hearing about it, then I think that's what the Heritage Foundation's point is. The other thing is the people on the no-fly list don't know they're on the no-fly list often, and the no-fly list is uh, just simply a security pro precaution that the people who are on the FBI's list for suspected terrorism or, you know, other criminal activity will be put on the no-fly list by the FBI just so that they don't get on a plane and do something crazy. Um, and they don't get a notice in the mail that says the FBI has placed you on the no-fly list because it's usually in the midst of an ongoing investigation that they get there. So uh, like we were talking about before with the reason why the police can't just always hold a press conference and tell everybody everything that's going on, the FBI doesn't hold a press conference and say, we've added the following 28 people to the no-fly list today, because obviously that gives information to what is largely now terrorists uh, who are on that list. So I think there are all kinds of problems with her plan to do that, um, and I don't think it's going to go anywhere. But I think, as you pointed out, Susan Collins is a moderate Republican from Maine. Her, her career is based upon her... Um, argument that she can work both sides of the aisle, that she's comfortable working with Democrats and working with Republicans. I think this was an attempt to come up with a gun control idea that didn't take guns from people like you and I who are law-abiding people, but added a measure of security for those who are worried about anybody having guns. And I think it just doesn't work for the reasons we mentioned, but I think that's what she was trying to do. And then you had the senator from, uh, uh, is it uh, Chris uh, uh, Murphy from Connecticut? Yeah, Connecticut guy, and doing he, his filibuster thing. Doing his filibuster, mm -hmm. and he got caught up on an interview over the weekend where someone pointed out that all of his proposals would not have mattered in either Orlando or San Bernardino. Right. So it's and all that, for show, isn't it? Well, it's not for show. I mean, they mean it. I mean, they are intent on restricting gun rights, and uh, it's not for show. It's more using those incidents as an excuse to push the anti-gun agenda, and and that's clearly what it was. And the fact that they wouldn't have prevented it comes out every time. I mean, almost all of these people that are engaged in these mass shootings either got their guns legally or they got them through some illegal means that wouldn't have been prevented by the law anyway because, you know, they're intent on shooting a bunch of people. Um, you know, they, you, you don't really stop those kind of, you know, determined terrorist people by having laws that prevent law-abiding people from carrying guns because they're not going to abide by them. We have a caller with us. Caller, we've got about a minute and a half before the break. You're on the air. Uh, yes, Mr. Loeb, uh, I was just curious, are we... Uh, or do you know of a, are we under a higher security level now than before Orlando, the people in Idaho? I mean, has it been raised anything in Idaho or? Well, um, anytime an incident like that happens, um, there is coordination nationwide with federal law enforcement people and the federal law enforcement people do confer with the local law enforcement about, you know, what the security risks are. Uh, I don't know that there is a specific higher uh, threat level been issued because of that shooting, but anytime there's anything, whether it's public, whether a shooting happens, or whether there's um, a lot of chatter on the internet about we're going to do something, or one of the big anniversaries comes up, uh, there is, a, it's not like a threat level thing, it's not like it goes from orange to red or something. But there, there is constant information exchange between the people who hear the threatening information and the local law enforcement so that everybody can be on guard for it. But I, I don't think there's anything that, any, that private citizens would notice. I want to thank you for the call. We've got a break coming up shortly. And I know that uh, some of the sheriff's deputies have told me that they have already gone through some extensive training mm -hmm. where they would be able to spot things like this long before even San right. Bernardino. Right much less Orlando. And so 
Uh, there are constant programs that are going on, not only, I guess, at the local level, but with state police, too. And that's been ongoing since 9-11, really. Uh, and, you know, there there is all kinds of constant upgrade in training for people that are uh, first responders and, and uh, police, um, you know, uh, the governor's office, the National Guard, all those people have have had a lot of extra training that started way back after 9-11. We've got more with Grant Lubbs coming up. Uh, one more segment of the show on Top Story. Also with Bill Colley on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. And I'm going to call it 71. Our studio guest is Grant Lubbs. He is the county prosecutor in Twin Falls County. Bill Colley with you as well on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Telephone number if you'd like to reach the prosecutor before the hour ends. 736-0300. That's 736-0300-944. And uh, we've got 71. Just very quickly, I know it's a personal matter, but you were telling me that your son graduated uh, college uh, and you were off to Vermont for a couple of days. And, and um, that's got to be a good feeling when you get to that point and all of a sudden you realize, okay, they're on their own now. It's a scary feeling cause <laughs> for two reasons. One, you realize they're on their own now, which is scary because... Who is he to be on his own? Uh, secondly, um, you know, it really kind of accentuates how much older you are <laughs> because right. I can't even imagine that I have a, a child that's already graduated from college. But, you know, uh, he did very well, and uh, it was fun to go back there and, and see that. And um, it was uh, it was kind of a break, but it was really fast-paced. I mean, there was a lot to do, and, you know, I had to – it had to help him pack, had to help him move his stuff. I mean, it's funny. They, they graduate you uh, at noon on Sunday, and then they tell you you got till 11 o'clock p.m. to get everything out of the dang place because they're going to lock the doors and kick you out. And it's like you lived there for four years, and you got all this stuff, and it, uh, it was a marathon packing session for yeah, sure. I know that my own experience, I think that I packed everything into the car on a Friday night graduated on Saturday morning and, and slept in an empty room. Yeah. And then just... Well, he kept... did that largely, but he had so much stuff that it couldn't all go in a car, and plus he's out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so we had to uh, take uh, 17 boxes of stuff to the U-Haul place and mail it to my house. And so uh, by the time I got back, I had piles of UPS boxes on my front doorstep. And it was... The one nice thing about Middlebury, though, it's got that series of small waterfalls. Yeah, it's a pretty place. It is just beautiful. Yeah, I used yeah. to take my, my daughter and niece there uh, for ice cream, so I know a little bit about the area. Uh, we're, we're wrapping up our program today with about, oh, just under 15 minutes to go. Uh, we, we've touched on a lot of topics. I emailed you one the other day. One of my old bosses uh, left the broadcasting business, and he's now selling something, that I guess, that's akin to legal insurance. Mm. What a person does is they come to his office, he sells them a policy, and then they pay a flat fee every month and uh, that flat fee if they need a lawyer in six months it pays for the lawyer if they need a lawyer in six years it pays for the lawyer but he says this is done because a lot of people simply can't afford uh, a great big throw all mm -hmm. at once with legal costs have you ever heard of anything like this being done before yes in fact uh, there was a service um offered um, to Twin Falls County people where you could pay extra out of your paycheck and you would get this uh kind of on-call lawyer thing um, a while ago. And, uh, you know, it's it's not a bad idea. Um, you don't get necessarily to pick who your lawyer is. You don't get a specialist lawyer necessarily. Uh, but I never used it, so I don't know what I would have gotten had I had a legal problem. But um, yeah, I can understand why it's an attractive uh, product because if you get in trouble or you need to have a you know, a contested divorce or you need to, to fight a will or something like that, and uh, you pick up the phone and you ask a lawyer how much that is, that's going to be, we need this much up front and we need this much as we go and we need this much at the end. So it, it can be a lot of money. Um, and if you've got one kind of on a monthly retainer where it takes a little bit out of your paycheck every month, uh, I can see why that might be a good idea. It shouldn't hurt the quality of your representation either, though, because... No, not necessarily. Like it all depends company, on who the lawyer is. Right. It pays yeah. out a, a, the, the money that that lawyer would demand. Right. And and so, therefore, you know, you don't have to worry about skimping on the cost of it at all. 
Right, and it all it always depends on the actual lawyer that you get. I mean, you can pay a lot for a bad lawyer just as much as you can pay a little for a good lawyer. It's uh, mm-hmm. it's it's all personality and uh, and work ethic and competence and intelligence and um, there's no reason why that would lead to a bad lawyer. Now, speaking of, of, of law, and this is this gets back to your office, uh, we talked about Supreme Court earlier. A lot of people probably aren't aware of this, but you don't have to be a lawyer to be a justice of the Supreme Court. On the other hand, to be the prosecutor in Twin Falls County, I, I would assume you have to be, uh, you have to have a law degree, right? To be a prosecutor in Idaho, you have to be admitted to the bar and a member of the bar in good standing. In some states that's not true in some states because the the head prosecutor is um so much of that work is administrative and you know budgetary and you know policy setting uh you don't have to even be a lawyer now if you're a, if you're a prosecutor in one of those states you can and you're not a lawyer you can't go into court though i mean you can't try a case um you can't you know, do the legal things that lawyers are, are able to do with, with their license. But you can run the office and you can supervise other people. It becomes more of a CEO kind of a job uh, rather than a, a job where you're also active in making the legal decisions and doing the legal work. Well, I, br- I bring that up because one of the uh, folks at last night's council meeting uh, was looking to find someone to challenge you in November's oh, yeah. election. And since you don't have an opponent in the general election as a Democrat, uh, no Democrat uh, obviously wanted the job. Uh, is there any time left? I mean, could you see someone? Is there still a filing period where an independent could pop up? No, uh, the filing periods are all over. Um, to get on the ballot, um, a, a person for any elective position uh, in Idaho, you can run as a write-in um, up until you know late in the game. But uh, you can't get on the ballot. Uh, after the primaries are over because that's the point of the primaries is to put people on the ballot so you could have run as an independent or as mm-hmm. a democrat or as a constitution party person by winning the that party's primary and then you'd be on the ballot but this is uh this is uh this is i think something to note we talked earlier about how the general public i think oftentimes does not understand what your job is all about and, and and that's probably the the corollary there is they don't understand how anybody would go about challenging for that job. Uh, and it does, I hate to say this, it shows us that perhaps we fail people with civics education at some point. Well, I mean, I think, I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's kind of obvious. Um, you know, it's an elected position. We just had a primary uh, where I was challenged, uh, as was the sheriff and, you know, two of our three county commissioners. Um, the process worked. Um some people, some incumbents won, some incumbents lost, and uh, that dealt with, of course, just the primary. Uh, only one of those now has a challenge in November, and that is uh, the uh, the race for county commission uh, for, I think that's the third district. Um, and that's the Jack Johnson, who will be challenged by Jill Scheme in, as a Democrat in for that position. So I think that anybody who's paying attention at all understands that we have a, an elective system and that there are usually two phases, a primary and a general election. Um, but I think what, what you're, one of the things that you mentioned there, it is um, confusing to people when they ask, as I often hear, you know, who's the sheriff's boss? Um, who is the prosecutor's boss? Who, who can fire the prosecutor? Well, as was mentioned by one of the city councilmen yesterday, um, I think Mr. Lanting said, well, the prosecutor was is elected. You, the people, can fire him if you unelect him. But once he's elected, he doesn't have a boss um, any more than a senator has a boss or a congressman has a boss or a city councilman or a county commissioner has a boss. These people are independently elected. They're not hired by somebody above them. Um, and I think that's a good system because it allows the most control at the local level. Um, it's always interesting to me that uh, people who, a lot of a lot of times, the people who are so anti-government are always looking for a higher government authority to order their local officials to do things. Um, you know, there's got to be somebody who can order our county commissioners to do something. I'm going to call the governor. Well, he can't order your county commissioners to do something. Well, I'm going to call a senator then. 
again, he's a federal officer. He can't order your county commissioners to do things. Well, I, I worked at a county years ago where uh, the locally elected sheriff went before the uh, what they had a county council versus a commission or a, a legislature, and he had to go before the council. And one of the members of the council was upset with him about something and said, you know, that's a terrible way to treat your bosses. And he said, I remind you, I am independently elected as you are, and you're not the boss. But as a department head, which you also are, you have to go to the commission, though, still to talk budget right. because they the, set the dollars and cents. One of the jobs of the county commissioners is to set the budgets for all the offices, uh, both the elected ones and the ones that are hired and appointed. Um, and, and the, you know, with that power, there is occasionally the attempt to use that power to set policy. Um, it, it certainly has happened throughout the state in various places, and those are usually places where the elected officials don't get along. Um, that's never happened in Twin Falls County uh, with any uh, of the offices. It's certainly not to any significant extent. I mean, the commissioners here have always known that their job is to be fiscally responsible for a, for a you know a conservative budget, and they give you a, a budget, and they don't try to tell you you know what to do uh, with it um, in terms of how to do your job. And that that is good because obviously the county commissioners uh, are not prosecutors, they don't know what my job is to the level that they would need to to run the office that way. So, and the same with the sheriff. I mean, if uh, if I were a county commissioner and I were trying to tell the sheriff how to do his job, um, that would be ridiculous. I don't know what the sheriff's job is. I don't I don't know how to run a jail. Um, and uh, But the, the commissioners are responsible for making sure that you account for the money you spend and you do so responsibly. I don't know that you're endorsing anyone, but uh, come January, you could have two new county commissioners who do understand law enforcement, and one of them would know about running a jail. And in that situation, at least there would be people in that, that position who would understand the challenges right. that law enforcement and prosecutors have to go through. Right. And I, I think, well, no matter what, we'll have two new county commissioners in January. Um, we just don't know um, in one of the races who it will be. But um, the county commissioners, like city councilmen, like congressmen and senators, they bring to the job their background and their experience. And I am always happy to have somebody in those positions who understands what we do. Uh, and I'm sure the sheriff uh, is as well. Uh, and But even if they have n don't know anything about it, even if they come from maybe a real estate background or a farming background, um, County commissioner's job is so multifaceted. They have to know a little about everything, whereas the sheriff and the prosecutor and the coroner have to know a lot about one thing. And uh, it works pretty well. I think they, uh, in Twin Falls anyway, they they accept our advice and counsel, and they accept that we, you know, know our job better than they will know our job. But they uh, work with us on the budget, obviously. And, and you know, you think about that though. When the methamphetamine epidemic first hit, and you had to go to them and say, "Probably we need more resources because of this," they understood. Uh, but if there's two of these men running right now that would definitely understand because they've been out on the front lines against it as well. And so, uh, there are people who bring unique experiences mm -hmm. into a particular position that would favor uh, your office in that sense. Perhaps, but, I mean, you never know until you bring the issue to them. I mean, I would never assume that because, um, you know, for instance, Don Hall uh, is has a background as a policeman that, that I could just go in and know that he's going to vote with me because I'm law enforcement. I, I would have to make my case and make it carefully and argue it responsibly in order to expect that I would get anything uh, in the way of an increase in a budget for, for something like what you just mentioned, like, lots of methamphetamine coming to the valley. Uh, but over the years, um, there have certainly been times when I felt that we needed more money and there's not enough money and so we don't get it. But by and large, I, uh, I've found that I've gotten a good hearing and that if I make a good case, then uh, they grant me the, the money to do what my office needs to do. You know, I, of course, in Don's case, as you mentioned, uh, you know, you've got to be a good generalist. As he once told me, he said, Prior to being elected to the city council, he would not have known much about water, wastewater management, but now he knows these things. And these sure. are there's a little bit to be said about experiences that people do bring to a particular office. Right. And, you know, um, an office like mine or the sheriff's or the coroner's or the treasurer, the assessor, 
I mean, they don't necessarily need to bring a broad uh, range of experience um, to do a job that's fairly well defined. But the commissioner's job is so general um, that you know it's good to have different people from different backgrounds there, uh, and you know each one brings a little bit of different perspective, and I think that's a good thing. I want to thank Grant Lobes for dropping by today. Coming up on 10 o'clock, Rush Limbaugh will be along following the news from Fox. Uh, Bill Colley with you as well saying, uh, God willing, the creek don't rise. They'll allow me to come back and do this all over again tomorrow morning between 8 and 10 o'clock right here on News Radio 1310. KLIX and News Radio 1310.com.